Okay, good evening and welcome to our live chat for week three. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, DDL and DML in SQL. And then tomorrow I'll hold another live chat if you can make it. If not, that's fine. I'm going to record that one as well <clears throat> to show you how to make changes to those sample files I provided on my website, the DDL, DML, and report.sql file. I'll show you how to make and modify those using SQL Server Management Studio, um, which you should have downloaded and installed if you don't have a Mac computer and if you didn't have any problems. If you still need help or assistance with that, just reach out and let me know and I'll see what I can do to help. So tonight, like I said, we're gonna talk about DDL and DML. So we'll go ahead and get started. First, we'll talk about data manipulation, which is DML. Um, it's part of the language in, in SQL that lets you manipulate the data. Um, we'll go through some objectives of SQL and give you some examples and show you the format and structure of all the SQL code um, that we're gonna use. So. Ideally, a database language should allow the user for, to create a database and relational structure to perform insertions, modifications, deletions of any data from those relations or tables, right? Perform simple and complex queries. Um, our query is gonna be fairly simple um, to keep it easy. Uh, it must perform, you must perform those tasks with minimal user effort and command structure syntax must be easy to learn. Um, and it must be portable, meaning you could use SQL on any other relational database that uses SQL as its querying language. Um, SQL is transform-oriented language, has two major components, a DDL for defining the database structure itself, and a DML for retrieving and updating that data. It's relatively easy to learn. It's non-procedural. You specify what information you're going to require from the database rather than how you're going to get it. It is essentially free format, and I'll show you that structure as we move forward. It consists of standard English words. And so here are some examples of some SQL statements. You'll notice that it's fairly straightforward and it does use standard English words, create table, um, staff is the name of the table. And then we have our fields indicated inside the parentheses and with their data types. And those are all separated by commas. We have an insert into statement where we're inserting data into that table. We have to tell it what the values are that we're gonna insert. So that's what that means. And then we have a select statement where we're gonna select that same data we just inserted from that table but we're looking for those that have a salary that's greater than 10,000. So this, these are just a few examples of some SQL query statements. Um, it can be used by a range of users, including DBAs, your management team, any application developers, or any type of end user, business analyst, systems analyst, whoever may need to get data from a database, they're gonna use SQL. Um, importance of SQL, um, it has become a part of all application architectures. It is a strategic choice for many large and influential organizations. It is a federal information processing standard or FIPS standard to which conformance is required for all, any or all sales of any databases to the American government. Uh, it must use SQL. It is also used in other standards and even influences development of other standards such as a definitional tool. Some examples are this ISO's Information Resource Directory System or IRDS standard and then there's remote data access or RDA standard. They all incorporate SQL within them. Um, an SQL statement by itself consists of reserved words and then user defined words. So the reserved words are a fixed part of SQL and must be spelt exactly as required and cannot be split across lines. The user defined words are ones that are made up by you, the user, and represent names of various database objects like relations or tables, right? Columns and views. Most components of an SQL statement are case insensitive, meaning you can make it all uppercase, you can make it all lowercase, you can make it upper and lowercase, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's more readable when indentation and linearization is, in, is used within your SQL statements and in your code. Each clause should begin on a new line. Start of a clause should line up with start of other clauses. If the clause has several parts, should each appear on separate line and be indented under the start of a clause. If you look at the sample files I provided there in um, a very formatted structure right, with a different line for every different command and um, to keep it, you could you could essentially write it all in one straight line. It doesn't make it easy to read. It's, it's, it is a lot more readable with line breaks and indentations in it um, when you're trying, especially if you have a very long SQL code. Um, writing SQL commands, they use what's called an extended form of BNF, Bacchus Nor form notation where uppercase letters represent reserved words, the lowercase letters represent user-defined words, a pipe indicates a choice among those different alternatives, the curly braces indicates that it is a required element, a square brace indicates it's an optional element, 
and then the three dots indicate optional repetition of zero or more of those elements. Uh, a literal, um, literals are constants used in SQL statements. All non-numeric literals must be enclosed in single quotes. So for example, London as the city, or if you're doing uh, any field that's a character or var char, those are literal strings. They must be enclosed in single quotes when inserting data into the database for those strings. All nu not numeric literals must not be enclosed in quotes. So for example, this is $650 or, or for your order total, it would be a decimal. You won't enclose that in quotes when you insert into the database. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, this is that BNF, that structure of what a select statement looks like. Um, again, we have our reserved words are in uppercase. So select from, where, group by, order by, and having are all re SQL reserved words. You can't use those for field names or table names or, or anything else. Um, square brackets are optional, right? Distinct or all. Curly brackets are required. Um, you either have to use a wildcard or you have to use a column expression meaning the name of a column in your database. And you could use the as, which is another reserve word, an as keyword to assign a column a different name if you want to when it outputs. And then of course the dots represent repetition of zero or more of those. So you could select as many columns as you can from the database tables you're pulling the data from. From table name and then square brackets alias, which is optional, um, where condition, Group by having an order by. Notice those are all in square brackets, which then makes those optional elements. So you see the only two required elements are the select and the from. The other ones are all optional. The select specifies which columns are going to appear in your output. The from specifies the table that's going to be used. The where helps you filter rows, right? The group by forms groups of rows with the same column value. You can use a having clause, which filters those groups subject to some condition. So you have to have a group by before you can use a having. Um, and then an order by specifies the order of the output if you want it in any specific order. By default, um, SQL outputs data in ascending order. You can specify descending order by typing the descending, D-E-S-C keyword after the end of a field that you want to appear in descending order. Um, the order of the clauses cannot be changed. So it has to be select from where group by having or by, it has to be in that order. You, you can't move those around, which kind of makes sense logically, right? And only the select them from mandatory, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you can have calculated fields. Um, here we have a command to produce a list of monthly salaries for all your staff, showing staff number, their first and last names and a salary. So we do our select and it's in uppercase throughout the entire slide deck um, and in the code that I use. I put the reserve words in uppercase to make it easier for you to remember that the reserve words are in uppercase. The lowercase or paragraph sense staff number, first name, last name, salary divided by 12 from that staff table. And then this picture shows you um, what that output would be. Notice this one says column four here and it doesn't have a column name. It does that because we just we just performed a calculation in here, but we didn't give it an alias using the as keyword. So it just arbitrarily names the column, column four. If we redo that same query, you use the as clause. So now we can run that query, the same select statement from the staff table, but this time we wanna call um, our salary calculation as monthly salary. Um, doing a comparison search. Um, you can do a comparison search. So now we're throwing in a where clause, right? We're going to select whatever field we want from our salary, our staff table. But this time we add this where condition here. We want to only look for those where the salary was greater than 10,000. So it reduces the number of rows returned to four because all those are the only salary or employees that have a salary that are greater than 10,000. A compound comparison search condition. So you can, in your where clause, you can search on with multiple items like we do here, right? Here they did. Um, they use the wild card, select star or asterisk. The asterisk returns all of the columns from whatever table you're selecting in the from. So it's going to return every single column that's in that table. If you had 50 columns, you'd see all 50 columns. If you only need to see specific columns from a table, you have to explicitly list the column names up here. Otherwise, you'll get all of them using this wild card. But in this instance, we only want it where the city is equal to London. And notice that London is a literal string. It's enclosed in quotes. 
or we're using an or condition, or the city is equal to Glasgow. So we're only looking for those records, and those these are the only three that are returned that meet that where condition. Um, you can use a, a range for a search condition using a between um, keyword, right? So our select and our from are from that staff table. But now we're, we're looking for where this salary from this table is between two distinct values, between 20,000 and 30,000. This between keyword tests the endpoints of that condition. So it's if somebody had $20,000 as a salary, they would show up in this table. Notice that it checked this person had 30,000 and it did return that value. So it checks for everything from there to there. Um, this there's also on the Gator version, not between this doesn't really add much value. Um, this writing it this way to me is really confusing where the salary is greater than or equal to 20,000 and it's less than or equal to 30,000 is the same thing as the between operator. The between is a lot cleaner. Um, and I think it just looks better. Um, setting membership, you set membership using the keyword in, as we do here in this statement. Um, here we're going to list all the managers and supervisors. We could have like 30, maybe we have maybe we have 10 different positions within this company, whatever company this is. And we only want to see those people that are managers and supervisors. So we use this, um, we search inside this field position where the values manager or supervisor exists using the in keyword. If you had lots of different values, you could search for more than those. Um, depending on what you're looking for, uh, it makes it easy to find records that only match that certain condition using in. So that's a good good one to remember. Uh, pattern matching. And this is one reason why it's better not to store an address um, completely in one field like they did here. I know I commented that on several people's um, IP2 with their structure of your tables with address as one field. I would break address out into its component parts. Um, one, to make it easier for reporting um, and and also for data entry. Um, so here we're selecting some different fields from this private owner table where the address is and we use the keyword like, because if we want to use wildcards, we have to use the like keyword. And then here we put, so Glasgow is a literal string. So inside single quotes, we put our word Glasgow, but then before it, we put a percent sign before it and a percent sign after. To find any string that has that keyword in it, and the, notice there's only three records returned. SQL has two special pattern matching symbols, the percent sign, sequence of zero or more, and then the underscore, which is any single character. So it finds everything looks for any number of characters before the word you're looking for and after the word you're looking for. And it's good that way we'll capture everything that's in that field that has that word in it. And that like in these uh, wildcards, I use those quite a bit when I'm searching text, especially searching a text field. If you're looking for a certain string of characters, um, it comes in very handy to use. Um, null search condition. So let's list the details of all the viewings from this property where a comment has not been supplied. There are two viewings for this property, one with and one without a comment. You have to test for null explicitly using a special keyword is null. Null search continue. So uh, there's only, there's two, right? So one that only returns one record because one of them has a comment and the other one didn't. Um, you can do some single column ordering in SQL. Um, Remember we talked about the order by clause. It tells you what order you want to see your data in. And I said, if you wanted to do it in descending order, you have to explicitly state that with the DESC reserve word, um, like we do here. So it shows the salaries in descending order. So it shows highest to lowest. Um, you can do multiple column ordering. Initially, we're going to order, we're going to pull all this data out, and we're only going to order it by the type, right? So type is flat in house. So it ordered it by type. It put in ascending order alphabetically because we didn't specify descending. But notice the rooms, um, I think the rooms and the rent. We have a higher rent, a low one, and then a higher one than this one. So the, the rent's not in any semblance of order in this return. So if we just change that statement and add rent as our order into our order by clause, and then by descending order, we'll get them in alphabetical order by flat type and then by the rent type with the highest 
being first down to the lowest for that specific type. So it's causing these um, to order it. And you can order it by other ways too. If you want, if you had other columns that you want to add to that, you can add as many as you like to the order by. As many as you like, of course, that makes, makes logical sense when you're trying to view the data. Um, select statements. In a select statement, you can do aggregate functions like you can in Excel. You can do um, the ISO standard defines five. Um, there's count, sum, average, min, and max. If you've worked in Excel all, at all, you probably are familiar with some of those, probably um, sum and maybe count. Um, but they're the same. Count simply returns a number of values. Sum returns the sum of those values. Average returns the average. Min is smallest and max, of course, is the largest. Um, each operates on a single column of a table and returns a single value. Count min and max apply to numeric and non-numeric fields, but the sum and average may only be used on numeric fields only. Apart from count star, which is a wild card, each function eliminates nulls first and operates only on remaining non-null fields. This count star or asterisk counts all of the rows of a table regardless of whether nulls or duplicate values occur. Now, if your database is structured correctly and you have normalization in place um, and you've went through your level of normal form, you shouldn't have any duplicate rows, right? Because they all have a primary key field, which should be unique. Um, you can use a distinct before a column name to eliminate any duplicates that may be possible. And then distinct has no effect with a min or max, but it may have some with your sum and average. So be careful with those. Um, these aggregate functions can only be used in, in the select list and in the having clause. If your select list includes an aggregate function, let's say um, we have to we have to do this total total sales by month by I think customer is one of our queries I think, um, so that this you're going to have other columns in that select statement, but if it only includes aggregate function and there's no group by clause, select list cannot reference a column out with an aggregate function. So if you're doing a sum of let's say some order total. And that's all you have, that's fine. You don't need to put a group by clause. But if you select customer ID, customer name, sum of order total, you have to now include those other two fields in a group by clause. Otherwise, you'll get an error message saying, you know, it, it's not going to function right. And I'll clearly show you that example tomorrow um, when I do some of the, I go through those report queries. I'll show you what that looks like. And the error you'll get if you don't include the group by clause. Um, doing this count star, remember count star is my count from properties for rent where the rent is greater than 350. Simple select statement, it's just counting records and there are five. Uh, we wanna know how many different properties were viewed in May of 2013. So now we're gonna get rid of some duplicates because it may be duplicates since we want a very distinct count of how many were done on a certain date. So count distinct property numbers as my count from this table where the view date and there's that between keyword, right? And we don't format our dates in this function. This is, I think this is a European function. We don't write our dates like that. So our dates would be um, 02 slash 01 slash 2023 and 02 slash 28 slash 2023 or 29, depending if it's a lead year. Um, but that between statement is only gonna look for ones that have that date range and it gives give you a distinct count back. And in this instance, there's only two records. Um, count and sum. Notice I can do multiple um, aggregate functions in the same select statement. That's perfectly fine and legal. You can do a count of counting staff numbers as my counts, sum of the salaries as my sum. So they only have two, two people that meet this where condition, right? Where my position equals manager. Um, there's two of them and their total salary together is $54,000. Um, this one, we're going to return min, max, and average staff salaries. Um, so we're doing the min, max, and average of the same field, returning it with a name, distinct name for each of those fields from this table. Notice there's no group by, not needed, because we're not selecting any of the fields that are not part of an aggregate function. So we don't need the group by clause. But you use the group by clause to get subtotals. Um, selecting group by clauses or integrated each item in a select list must be single value per group and select clause may only contain column names, aggregate functions, constants, or expressions that involve combinations of the above. All the column names in your select list must appear in a group by clause. So if you add a group by clause and you have 
five columns listed in your select statement, all five of those columns are going to have to be in that group by clause if you're going to group it. If a where is used with a group by, the where is applied first, and then the groups are formed from the remaining rows satisfying that predicate. ISO considers two nulls to be equal for the purposes of group by. So here we're going to find the number of staff in each branch and their total salary. So we're selecting branch number. We're doing this count of the staff number field, giving it alias my count. We're doing a sum of salaries from the staff table. Now notice now we have our group by in here because we have this branch number field, which is not part of an aggregate function. So we have to include it in the group by class. Um, and then we throw in this order by so that we can order it by branch number in the in ascending order. So B003 to seven, um, and it gives you the count of the staff numbers and the sum of the salary. Um, restricting groupings using a having clause. So having clause is only used um, with a group by clause to restrict groups that appear in your final result table. It's similar to a where clause, but the where filters individual rows in this group or having clause filters on your groups. Um, column names in your having clause must also appear in the group by list or be contained within an aggregate function. So we have an example here where we're doing uh, the using the having for each branch with more than one member of staff and number of staff in each branch give me the sum of their salaries. So we have our select, we have our branch number, which is going to be in our group by clause, right? Our counts again and our sum from the staff table, group by branch, but be, now we're throwing in a having count where the staff number is gonna be greater than one. So the staff number greater, the count of staff number is greater than one. We don't wanna see, there was one other row we turned in the previous one, I think it was B009. It only had one person in it and their salary showing. So we only wanna see the ones where the count of the staff number count is greater than one. So that's how you do that using a having clause. And then we're just going to order it by branch number again. Um, you can do subqueries within select statements. We won't get too deep into this because it can get quite confusing. Um, we won't, we, any of the queries we do won't have any subqueries in it, but just know that you can nest select statements within select statements. Um, a sub select can be used in where and having clauses of an outer select where it is then called a subquery or a nested query. Um, they may also appear in insert updates and delete statements. So I'll give you an example here. And in bold, bold letters and bold black font, I put the, the um, sub query, the nested query, so you could stand out and see it a little bit easier. We're going to list those staff whose salary is greater than the average salary and show by how much they're different. So we're going to select some fields, right? We're going to perform a calculation, but we don't know what number we want on the right-hand side of that calculation yet. So we're going to run a select statement to select the average salary from the staff. Um, and then we're gonna select that from salary. And that will give us the salary difference. But we only wanna see that where the salary is greater than the average of that salary from the staff table. So we have our, our sub select statements in here, right? In the aggregate function, the, the calculation we're doing, we can use it, which is legal. And then down here in our where clause. So when you run that query, um, it's going to, SQL Server is going to operate on your subqueries first, right? So remember it returned, there was a selecting the average of the salary, right? So it returned a value, 17,000 was the average. So it returned that value to the main query. So it ran that, it returns the 17,000 to two places since we used the same subquery. And now this statement will run and give you the results that you see on the left, on the right over here, I'm sorry. Subquery rules, the order by claw may not be used in a subquery. Order by, you can't use it, although it can be used in the outermost select statement. Subquery select list must consist of a single column name or expression except for subqueries that, that use exists. And by default, column names refer to a table name in the from clause or subquery. You can't refer to a table in a from using an alias. Um, when the subquery is an operand of an, in a comparison, subquery must equal on the right-hand side. Like we had our salary minus something. Our subquery was on the right-hand side. It must always appear on the right-hand side. We couldn't put that subquery on the left-hand side and subtract it from salary. You'd get an, you'd get an uh, error message trying to do that. Multiple table queries. You can use subqueries provided result columns come from the same table. If the result columns come from one or more than one table, you have to use a join. So to perform these joins, you include more than one table in the from clause, or the way I prefer, you use 
um, the alternative way to join. I don't like the multiple tables in the from clause. It's clumsy um, and it doesn't really show how your tables are joining. I'd like it a little bit cleaner. And that's the way I show you how to do it tomorrow. And I think I have some examples here as well. You use a comma separator, typically include a where clause to specify those join columns. That might be an older way of doing it. Um, um, we don't usually do it that way anymore. Also possible to use an alias for a table named in the from clause um, to make it easier. So if you're doing, you're selecting a bunch of columns from this one table and maybe five or six columns from this other table, instead of having to specify the name of the table, you can give the table a single letter alias works fine. So from staff table, a small s, you're going to join to the order table or whatever, um, make the order table O, um, and then you can use that alias in, in the statement where you tell it what those fields that are used to join those two tables. You can use it in your select statement at the top. You can use the alias to define as O dot order date, O dot order total, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, you can use the alias. Uh, makes it a little bit easier. Um, an alias can be used to qualify names where there is ambiguity, meaning that um, if you have two tables that are joined and you're returning, let's say, client ID or customer ID in your statement, both of the table you're joining to has client ID or customer ID, <coughs> excuse me, you have to tell SQL, well, which one of those two tables do you want this field to come from? Because I don't know. It's in both of the tables that you're showing. So then you just use the alias and tell it, okay, I want it from the order table or the customer table, whichever it may be. Um, so here we want to list all the names of clients who have viewed a property along with any comments applied. So notice here's where I'm using aliases. My from, I'm joining, I'm pulling from the client table and I'm joining to this viewing table. I aliased um, client as a small c and viewing as a small v. And then every place after that, I use the c and the v so I wouldn't have to type client dot field name or whatever. So this one, I only really need to do that since I'm selecting from client, right? I only need to use the alias in the select statement if I have a field that may cause ambiguity, right? So my viewing table has the same field, client number in it. So I tell it to pull it from the C, alias C, the client table. So C dot client number. First name and last name don't exist in the viewing table. They only exist in the client table. So I don't need to alias those. And neither does property number and comment. Those are all from the client table. But I'm joining to this table um, only um, to show probably the property number in the viewing table probably comes from that table. It doesn't exist probably in the client table, um, but I don't need the alias because it doesn't exist in the other table. You only need this alias when there's ambiguity. Remember that. Um, so my viewing, and then I have to tell it what fields I'm joining on. This, there's a typo there. That should be client number. On what two fields. So there again, here's my primary key field in the client table um, and my foreign key field in my viewing table. That's why some of you I commented that you have you have joins showing in your ER diagram, but there's no field that would make that join possible um, in either table. So if you're going to your order table um, between your orders and customers, your order table can have your customer ID. That's fine. That that will establish that join to the customer table. Orders to products, your order table can also have the product ID in it, and that will define that join to that product table. Um, and so forth and so forth. So if you're joining tables together, you have to have a way to join it so that you can write the join statement like this um, and tell us how those fields, how are this table is joined? What is the commonality that they have? And in this instance, it happens to be client number. Um, a simple join, uh, only those rows from both tables that have that identical value. So that join or a simple join, just the word join, only returns where they both have identical Identical values in the client number columns, client C dot client number equals V client number um, are included in the result. That's all you get to see. They also provide alternative ways. Um, join viewing. I don't use that using or natural join. So we'll skip that. Um, sorting a join. You sort a join just like you would um, any other SQL statement. You use your order by clause, right? You can order by, again, using aliases from your tables. Um, and field names. In this instance, we're going to order it by um, from the staff table, the branch number, and the staff number, and then the property number table, which is probably from this property for rent table. And this is the data that you get back. Um, you can do multiple table joins. I did one here um, to show you how to do that. You don't need to probably get that complex, but you can try if you'd like to try to do some 
multiple joins in your SQL statements and see what you get back. It's fun. Have some fun. Play around with it. You're not going to break anything. Um, the worst you can do is not get any data returned or get an error message. Um, and I'm more than willing, willing to help. If you get error messages, if you're trying to do some joins, um, you're having problems, just send me your code or send me a screenshot of it. <clears throat> and I can usually tell what's wrong. Um, and I need to know the structure of your tables too. Uh, multiple groupings, um, just a group by clause again, group by and we're doing order by group grouping on these two numbers. Now, remember, we added this group by, so we have to have all of the columns that are listed in our select statement that are not part of an aggregate function included in the group by clause. So that's what we get here. Um, we're just doing another join. Outer join, if one row of a join table is unmatched, the row is omitted from the result. Outer join operates, retain rows only that do not satisfy the join condition. So here we have these, we'll do a couple of joins and show you how it affects the results from these two tables, this branch number and this property for rent table. The first one is an inner join. We're gonna do an inner join for property for rent on the B, B city equals PP city. And we get two rows returned that meets this condition um, where these are joined, where those fields match uh, based on that inner join. It has two rows. There are no rows corresponding to branches in Bristol and Aberdeen to include unmatched rows in a result table. You can use an outer join. So we're gonna use an outer join or also called a left, left outer join, left join, same thing. Here, we're gonna do this left, so the left, and there's another one we'll talk about, which is a right outer join, a right inner join, a right join. So left always means the table that is at, um, comes after the from in your select statement. So from this table always represents the left table. Any table that represents here, this considered the right table. So if you were doing a right join, you would get all the data from this table and only that from this table that matched. But we're doing a left join. Um, so we're only going to include the rows of the first left table that unmatch with rows from the second right table. So now we're getting some nulls back, right? So we're using a left join and we're seeing where our nulls are because there's no data in this table that matches on the city. Is that what we're using to match on, um, the, using this left join? Notice we use the right join. Now our nulls are in the other table. Um, because we pulled everything from this property for rent table, but there were no matches on the city for those two that were up there. Um, and that returns some nulls. And if we do just a full join, we'll get everything from both tables and it will show us all of where our null values are. So you may, you may need to adjust your data then. It, this can help show some inconsistencies in your data. If you think every branch number should have a property number and a city associated with it, then you would know that you have some ones that are missing for Aberdeen and for uh, Bristol from this table. So it helps you kind of check your data as well. Um, this is a syntax for an insert statement. You use insert into, you specify your table name. Optional element is to include a column list of all the columns that you want to insert data into. Um, if it's omitted, SQL assumes you're going to um, insert data into every single column that you put in your create table statement and in the same order that you created them in. Any columns omitted must have been declared either null when the table was created unless default was specified when creating that column. Um, so we're gonna insert data into every single column in our database table. So there's no need to list them. Um, you can, if you like to try it, meaning then if you list them, if you have five columns in your table, whatever order you list them in here is the same order you have to specify the values that you're gonna insert into them. So it lets you mix up the order as long as those two orders match. If you don't list them, this list gets inserted exactly the way you created the table. Your data value list must match the column list. Number of items in each must be the same. If you built your customer table with five columns, your insert statement, <coughs> excuse me, must insert data into five columns. Must be direct correspondence and position. Of those items, data type of each in the data list must be compatible with the data type of the corresponding column. So if you have a field declared as a decimal or a date, you wouldn't want to insert um, a name or a varchar field into those. Um, you want to insert data that's appropriate for the data type that you specified. 
This shows you an example of an insert statement where they're inserting into the staff table. They supplied all the data for all the columns. So they have all the data on single quotes for all of that. This is a numeric, there's no single quotes. But that's the order they built the table. That's the order they insert the data. Um, this one here, they show you an example of <clears throat> where they specify the names of the columns they wanted to insert data into, and then they inserted the data in this same order into those columns. <clears throat> um, second form of insert allows multiple rows to be copied from one or more tables. So you could essentially build a table based on a select statement that you may build. So if you have a select statement that has a bunch of joins in it or some data that you currently you want to use all the time, you could insert it into a table and build a table based on that select statement. Um, you just do insert into table name and then your select statement. And when you run that code, it would create a table with the data that returned based on your SQL statement. Um, assume there's a table named staff prop count that contains names of staff and number of properties they merge. So here's our table structure, staff number, first name, last name, property count. Um, populate this table using the staff and property for rent tables. So this one gets a little complicated. We have to do these sub-select statements and we have to use this union statement. So um, this just gives you an example of how to do that insert into, into another table, right? Based on data from other tables and queries that you have. We have a bunch of select statements and then a sub-select statement in here. So we won't get too deep into this one. Just know that it's possible to do it that way. Update table name, um, update statement. We're gonna do some updates for IP3. You have to update some data um, in your table. You just simply tell it update, you give it the table name, you use a set keyword or a you know, standard word, and you tell it what column you want to set a value for. Right? So if we're going to maybe update my uh, customer table, I want to update um, address two field. So I'm going to set address two equal to uh, PO box 100. Where, if I don't specify a where, which is optional, if I don't specify where, it updates every single row in the table. Um, that entire column gets updated to that value that I specified. But if I tell it where uh, client ID or customer ID equals a certain value, it's only going to update that one record. So where 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 update and delete um, are very powerful commands. Make sure you use where statements with all of those unless your purpose is to actually affect all of the data in your database. Then you don't need to worry about it. But the where condition will uh, save you a lot of headache. It's optional. Um, of course, the data value you're setting, whatever that field to, must be compatible with the data type for the column you're setting it. Um, here's an example where we did update a whole table. We updated the staff table. We set salary to salary times 1.03. We gave everybody a 3% raise. But then we wanted to give only the managers the 5% increase. <clears throat> so we did that, and we used our where, where condition here, um, where we're only giving the managers this, this salary increase. So that's where this comes in handy. Um, here we're updating the staff table. We're going to promote this person to a manager. And we're going to set a salary to eighteen thousand um, dollars. So we have to update. If we didn't use the where clause, it would update every single person in the database to that uh, to that position to that salary. We know his staff number is SG fourteen, so we use that in our where clause to only make sure we update his one record. Delete statement, just like I mentioned with the update, you delete from, you just give it the table name. Without a where condition, it deletes all of the data out of your table. The where condition will only de delete the record that meets meet that certain search condition like client number or customer ID is or product ID is, whatever, a value you enter. Um, that will only affect that one record. Um, so here's more examples of that. Delete from viewing where property number equals PG14. It would only delete the one row or a couple of rows if however number of property numbers. Delete all the records from the viewing table. Delete from viewing. That empties the table of data. Um, it doesn't affect the structure of the table, only the data residing in the table. So you still have your table structure in place that you can insert data back into. Uh, now we'll touch on SQL data definition briefly, and then we'll talk about the individual project. Um, SQL DDL allows database objects like schemas and domains, tables, views, and indexes to be created and destroyed. I underlined the create and alter table statement because that's the one we're really focused on, this create table statements. Um, the relations and other database objects exist in your environment. The schema is a name collection of related database objects. 
Um, objects in a schema can be tables, views, domains, assertions, coll collations, translations, character sets, all have the same owner. And by standard, I think DB, uh, the database owner in SQL Server is DBO, database owner. Um, so if you were to drag, uh, create your tables, drag your table name and drop it onto the screen where you do a query, it would put in front of the table the, the alias or the domain name, DBO, uh, the owner, and then dot then the name of the table. So you can create different, um, I do work with some databases where they have different um, schema owners. Sorry, I got blanked there for a second. Um, well, they have different schema owners. Um, they do that to help organize those tables in an organized manner. One of them is like maintenance is an owner, um, updates is another owner, or updates or something else. And there's a bunch of different ones. But then when you look in the database structure, you can see those are all grouped together by the database owner. So um, it's good for um, organizing your database structure. But we're just going to worry about DBO. That's all we need to use. We don't need to create any new schemas or owners. Um, this is that create table statement um, structure for the create tables where you list your table name you're going to do. You specify your columns and your data types. I simplify it a lot because notice you can do foreign key in here. You can do primary key in here. Um, I show you a very simple structure of this. If you look at the sample files I provided, the structure is a lot simpler than this. We don't do primary and foreign key constraints in our create table statements. I'll show you that later. We do alter table statements and add those later. I found that to be easier for beginning owners or beginning SQL people. Um, because if you don't do it that way and you do the foreign keys in here, then you have to make sure that you create your tables in a very distinct order, right? In order to create a foreign key constraint, that field you're using in that foreign key constraint must exist in the database before you can create as a foreign key. So if you don't create the table that has the primary key field you're using as your foreign key in this table, you'll get an error message. So I find the easier way to do it. Um, we'll do it the easy way. We won't make this too difficult. Um, create table creates the table with whatever number of columns you specify with the data type that you specify. Um, primary key should always be specified as not null. And I'll show you that as well. Um, we won't do our foreign key that way. Um, this is an example of a very simple create table statement, create table cable customers. There's my field name, data type, null or not null. And in this instance, the primary key one is always the first field you enter. Um, identify it as primary key this way. And then we just list all of our other fields in order that we want with the data types, and then either null or not null. Um, making them not null requires you to insert data into those fields when you're inserting data into your table. So, you know, try to think about it logically, which data would you not want to be present in your database when you're collecting data from whatever application may be attached to the database. Um, a good example of having one that is null is address two field because not everybody has an address two field, right? It may be a apartment number, a PO box number or something. Um, you can make those null because not everybody has that. And that way it won't prevent you from inserting data into your table. Um, and then this is an example of just what an alter table statement looks like. And we'll go um, into this. I'll explain this in depth tomorrow. Um, so we can you can do that after you do your create table statements. We can do some alter table statements to add our foreign key constraints. And I like doing it this way. Um, it allows you to give the constraint an actual name. Um, and then this just specifies the foreign key. What field in this table? Um, which field in this table is my foreign key field and what field does this represent in my other table? What other table has that field that makes that establishes that join between those two fields, right? Um, that's why I usually leave my ID fields um, the same name in whatever table I insert it into. So if I'm putting customer ID in here and in my order table customer ID, I'm going to name it the same thing. So I don't get too confused. It's easier to see that, okay, they're both named the same. Um, it makes it a lot easier to update. Alter table lets you do all of these fun things, adding columns, deleting columns, um, adding new constraints or removing them, setting a default or dropping a default. Um, I won't go over this one right now. We'll do that for tomorrow night. Drop tables, um, drop table, table name, restrict or cascade, drop table. If you wanna drop a table for some reason, if you have a foreign key constraint established on that table, you can't drop the table without dropping the foreign key constraint first. Um, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, there may be some instances where you want to drop your table because maybe you want to increase the size of a field or add another field to your table that you may have forgot about. So you're going to have to drop that table. Or you can use an alter table statement and insert the new column, right, or alter the columns. But it's easier for us if we just drop it, modify your create table statement 
to the way it needs to be, rerun that statement, and that recreates your table. So um, our assignment, your case study store has provided a list of reports and data manipulation tasks that are needed for the processing of your orders for your customers. Write structured query language, SQL statement scripts are needed to create the database for the relational database system and manipulate that data in the solution you're proposing for the company. How does each of these scripts specifically support the goals and objectives of your company? Um, deliverables are data manipulation tasks, um, inserting 20 records into every table for testing purposes. You only need to, you only need to insert 20 records into the three tables um, that they give you to begin with, right? They give you orders, customers, and products. I want to see 20 records into each of those tables. The other tables you have in your database, insert as many records as you think you need um, to be realistic, right? And to actually give some data um, for you to manipulate, to update or delete, or to return in your queries. Um, you have to delete an entire order by using a unique identifier. Unique identifier specifically states that it's, is referencing the primary key field, right? So using a primary key field for that table, for that order, delete one. Update the price of a product using its unique identifier. Then add a three of your own data manipulation tasks based on the needs and specifications of your store. So add a couple more deletes or updates, um, just a total of three more, um, and you'll be good. These are, these are the reports you have to do. You have to do a revenue by sales per month, group by customer, revenue sales per month, group by product, and a total count of products, group by category. And those, those are all, I believe, in the sample files I provided. So we'll take a look at those. You can use those queries. You just have to modify them to meet, uh, match the table names in your table. And then three of your own report scripts. So do three more on top of that. One of them has to be a cross tab, and we give you a cross tab query that you can use. So you really only have to do um, two more. We'll make up two more different counts or different sales, min, max, I don't really care. Just add two more um, aggregate functions in your report list. <clears throat> um, then, of course, don't forget, provide your analysis on how this comes in every single project. This is in every paper, so do that. Um, these are the three files. This tells you um, which is in every file. Create and insert statements. Go in your DDL file. Your DML includes your delete and update statements. And then your report file has your select statements with your reporting, your cross tab query, and your aggregate function statements. Um, so they can be queued in any order. Note, you will embed each script in a Word document. So inside Word, there's a way to embed files. Um, if you don't know how to do that, I think I posted something in the announcement section. If I didn't, let me know. I think I have a video or something to show you how to do that. Or I can work with you and show you how to do that. It's fairly simple. Um, you're going to embed each of those in the Word document and then also provide them as attachments. So you should have four files uploaded when you upload your project for IP3. Your document, your name, cs660ip3.doc, and then your ddl.sql, dml.sql, and report SQL. I only want to see those three, three additional files in your Word document. And you don't have to rename those. You can leave those the way they're named, ddl, dml, and report, and then your Word document. Um, so embed those files and then upload the files and attach them. I'm going to need to I open those files and run that code to make sure that the code works. Um, if you're having problems, please reach out and let me know, um, and I'll um, work with you to get that done. Um, if you have problems embedding documents or you don't know how to embed a document into Word, <clears throat> copy the code from those three files and paste it into your Word document if you like. Um, but section three but should be fairly small, right? It has your three files embedded, and then your analysis section and any other text um, that you want to enter um, into that. So your tables that you're, your scripts that you're using to create your tables should match your ER diagram. If you need to, you can update your ER diagram to match what you might have finally come to um, for what tables you actually need in your database. So try to keep those two in sync. Then again, there's my email address, office hours, Wednesdays, live chats, any questions, comments, concerns, anything anybody needs help with. Um, I'm here, if you need me, um, just reach out at any time and I'll reply as, as soon as I can. That's about it for tonight, unless there's some questions. None here, sir, thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you very much for coming and have a great evening and let me know if you need any help. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.